Welcome all to the keynote address of the Gender and History Symposium on Food, Gender and Sovereignty here at Vancouver Island University. Let me begin by acknowledging that Vancouver Island University and the city of Nanaimo are located on the traditional territory of the Sanaima First Nation. Please always be appreciative of that fact and look for opportunities to further the process of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples wherever you can. For those of, us joining, for those of you joining us from elsewhere, please take a moment to consider the history and ongoing legacies of colonialism and learn about the people on whose territory you currently reside. I am from Montreal, Quebec, which is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe First Nations. Today is also Juneteenth, which has just been established as an American national holiday to commemorate the ending of US slavery. We are delighted to be hosting the stimulating symposium. The papers presented thus far have been creative, well-considered, and superbly researched, and we are confident they will form the basis for an exceptional special issue. We also want to thank our excellent special issue editors who put the program together. Heidi Gengenbach, Amanda Herbert, Shauna Sweeney, and Tracy Deutsch. We acknowledge the ongoing support of Nicole Bourgeois, the Assistant Vice President, and her team at the Scholarship, Research, and Creative Activity Office, Arts and Humanities Dean Marnie Stanley, Department of History Chair Tim Lewis, and the various university administrative and support people who helped us along through these challenging COVID times. And today we want to specifically thank uh, Liza and all of Eliza Gardner and Justin and the people here who are helping us put this together in our beautiful theater, which we'll be very happy to fill up sometime soon. We also acknowledge with thanks the support of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, the University of Minnesota, and Wiley Press, as well as our comrades in the UK Office of Gender and History. Because this is a webinar rather than a Zoom session, please type your questions in the Q&A feature rather than the chat. We will be monitoring these questions. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Amanda Herbert, who is Assistant Director of the Folger Institute of the Folger Shakespeare Library. Dr. Herbert will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I am delighted to be here with you today and even more honored to welcome Oza Soko, who's a food explorer and a traveler by plate who believes that food is more than eating. Central to her work is the unearthing and celebration of Nigerian and West African food and drink history paying homage to West African ancestors and their expertise, their resilience, and their creativity. Her research and documentation also explore the impact of West African intellectual contributions to global development from the American South through the Caribbean to Europe and Latin America, challenging myths and assumptions about West African legacies and gifts to the world, pre, during, and post transatlantic slave trade. Her 12-year-old blog, Kitchen Butterfly, is her creative space. In 2013, she articulated her philosophy and practice in the new Nigerian kitchen, focused on celebration and documentation, like, for example, the first ever seasonal produce guide for Nigeria, only one of a handful on the continent, guides to snacks and spices and more. She recently launched the tremendously exciting Feast Afrique a platform celebrating West African culinary heritage. And I've already used this in the classroom multiple times. It's an amazing resource. One major aspect of Feast Afrique is a digital library of more than 240 books, more than half of which document West African and diasporic food and drink heritage. She's an exploration geologist by training and recently completed a postgrad diploma in museum and cultural management at Centennial College in Toronto. Her work has been featured on CNN African Voices and Anthony Bourdain's Parts Unknown. 
She makes her home in Mississauga and wakes up to sun-streaked mornings on the couch, good book in hand with a pot of tea. She is a future New Yorker. Welcome, Lucas, and thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. It's my absolute pleasure to be here. And thank you everyone for joining. Before I um, launch in, again, I'd like to say thank you for having me as keynote speaker. And thank you to all the sponsors and everyone who has made this possible. I'm excited to be here. I've spent the last few days listening to the talks and the presentation of papers and there's so much that resonates that is thoughtful and thought provoking. And, you know, I'd like to say that I am not in academia. And, and so if I use some phrases out of turn, just put it down to my growing interest in academia, but I'm not quite there yet. So thank you very much. And, um, before we start, I'd like to share a land acknowledgement for the land I currently live and work on. So I live and work in Mississauga and Mississauga is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the credit. For thousands of years, indigenous peoples habit, inhabited and cared for this land. In particular, I acknowledge the territory of the Ishnabek, Hurunwendat, Hodushnoni, Ojibwe, Chippewa peoples, the land that is home to the Meti, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Living on this territory makes me and all the people who live here treaties people, including those who came as settlers or immigrants of this generation or earlier generations, including those brought in voluntary as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. Land acknowledgements are new to me. Uh, the first time I encountered them was last September when I started my museum and cult cultural management program at Centennial College. And it really struck me as really important. I was born and bred in Nigeria. And so though Nigeria is a, a, a British colony and then is in this neo-colonialist state, I never really thought about settler culture and, and the impact that had on land ownership and, and issues like that. Um, but there were many things that I could kind of see that existed in places where settlers had changed the landscape and changed attitudes and 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 different things. And, things like what crops are grown and how those take precedence. And so just discovering the land acknowledgement is something very, very important and a huge point of learning for me. And when I, when I tie that back to food sovereignty, I think about people's agency and their rights to healthy, culturally appropriate foods um, as is defined by La Via Campania. And, 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 you know, what are the food systems like? How are they sustainable? How do they fit in with the cultural frameworks? Those are things that are very, very important for me. And I'd like to begin this talk by sharing a number of things that I've had to come to terms with. Um, so like I said, I grew up in Nigeria and Nigerian food history Nigerians love food, they adore food, but there isn't a lot of documentation about Nigerian food culture. Um, that's changing and has and will continue to change in the next few years. But I realized that there's a lot that I had to unlearn in terms of the sources of our food, in terms of the how things came to be. And, West African culinary heritage is closely linked to African American food heritage, but it's not the same. They're, they're two parts of a story and there's a bridge between them. And so there's a lot that I've learned in the course of exploring um, food from a personal point of view, but also looking at it in terms of my community and the country I come from. And 
when I think of the way people have approached my work, sometimes it's, you know, there have been questions around what do you think as an African chef? Who are you as an African cook? And I've had to bring the distinction between being Nigerian, being West African, and also being African, because there are regional differences in, you know, in all of this. And um, so I kind of, re I accept that I'm an African cook and I bring an African lens to it, but there's a more detailed and focused approach in looking at West Africa and Nigeria. So the key thing for me is that there are many myths, things I've heard about West African cuisine that are foreign to me and, and things like, oh, there isn't really a rich West African culinary history and legacy. And some of the work that I will share shows that there is. And so I've largely spent my time trying to understand what Nigerian and West African cuisine is in the context of how it's been broadly defined, but also what Nigerians and West Africa, if West Africans think it is. And um, all of these go to frame who I am and how I explore the world. My research interests have largely centered on the everyday. So I've lived, the first time I lived abroad was in the UK and I was shocked at how homesick I was and just how much cooking Nigerian food comforted me. But I didn't really understand at that time the role of food, the role of memory, the role of memory as resistance, as, as bringing comfort. And so in the process of living abroad, a lot of the things that I've kind of become important to me are unearthing Nigerian culinary history. What is it? Does it exist? Uh, what are the elements of it? What do everyday people eat? And how does that compare and relate with what people in other parts of the world eat? And recently I've worked on a project over the last year called Coast to Coast. It had a very curatorial focus. Um, I worked with a curator, Koya Kouo, who uh, lives and works in Cape Town. And my idea was, how can I understand Nigerian cuisine and West African cuisine through looking at ingredients? So ingredients like rice, beans, palm oil, okra, sugar cane. And I wanted to explore time periods that began pre-colonial history through the transatlantic slave trade, colonial times, and now this post-colonial state that we're in. And, and in my food, putting on my food exploration hat, I was able to kind of research these ingredients, research their place in everyday culture, um, how we're eating them, how we're using them, things like rice, for instance, looking at connections between how rice exists in Nigeria and in West Africa, how it's eaten, how it's grown, how it exists today with a lot of imported varieties, but also the role it played during the transatlantic slave trade. And, and bringing all of that together with an aim to document uh, and preserve this knowledge, because that's something that's sorely missing in the space. Uh, I've also been looking at food systems, what are, uh, food security, sustainability. How do we, how do we document these things in a way that we create um, a reference framework that scholars, uh, people who have everyday interest, can delve into and you know find bits about their identity and and know a little bit more about who they are and and what their food culture and food history is. And so one of the outcomes from this Coast to Coast project was what I originally imagined as a print journal, but, but it started off as this digital collection. It's Feast of Freak and it's a documentation and celebration of West African food and drink knowledge and heritage. And part of that is a digital library, like Amanda mentioned, it has 240 books. Um, that have kind of put together, all of them are open access, you can, you can read them, but they cover a wide range 
of West African food history. And it starts in 1828 and continues to the 2000s. And, and a lot of the resources are based on work by Tony Tipton Martin in the Jemima Code, which is an extended bibliography of these books and Jubilee. But it also goes a little bit further. Um, and uh, th this resource, like I said, has been really useful in just helping me think about gaps in my knowledge, um, future scholarship that I hope people will end back on. And uh, yeah, in terms of my methods, uh, like I said, I'm not in academia, but a lot of the way that I frame my work is both from oral history, but also looking at archival documentation, a lot of inquiry. I also try to bring some data analysis into it. And all of this to show the existence of Nigerian and West African culinary heritage. But also in doing this, I've discovered that, yes, we're different, but there's a lot of connectedness across cultures and cuisines that can actually expand our fields of knowledge. The first place I'd like to start in is with Brazilian acarajé. Acarajé is something I discovered in 2009 to my great surprise. At the time I was living and working in the Netherlands and uh, had a Brazilian colleague. And we were talking one day about foods from home and he starts talking about a bean fritter, right? He's describing it and you know, and you can see waves of shock kind of course through my face. And he's like, oh, you know, it's this fritter, it's fried in dendê, which is what palm oil is, is described in, in as in Brazil. And before he could say anything, before he could even say akarajé, I was like, oh, that sounds like Nigerian akara. And he was like, yes, you know, in Brazil, in Bahia, in the Northeast, there's a huge Afro-Brazilian population, and this fritter is called a carajé. I was stunned. Um, I was in my 30s, but it was the first time that I had thought of Nigerian and West African food existing beyond Nigerian and West African borders. I had never really thought of Nigerian food as exportable. It was something I loved, I appreciated, but I never really thought about its presence. And that really sparked off this diasporic exploration that I went on. I was even more surprised to find that a carriage was eaten in a way that was very different to the way I know of it in Nigeria. And I'll show you a few photos. In 2004, the Brazilian Institute of uh, Historic and National, um, that's national body, uh, put Akarajé as intangible cultural heritage. And not just Akarajé, but about 15 other elements that include uh, how it's made, who makes it, where it's sold, and a number of things that go with it. And that was, surprising again to me because I'd never really seen food kind of elevated in the sense where it was seen as a cultural and a national icon. Um, I'd like to quote Professor Irina Mihalache, who says that to appreciate the biography of a recipe, we need to observe it in its proper historical, cultural, and social context. And looking at a character, it brought all these elements to my mind. You know, I'd never really thought about, like I said before, food as more than eating. Food was always this thing that satisfied a functional need, but it wasn't something I thought about as history or as, as a pillar of heritage. I never really considered it. And so painting that biography of a carriage, one of the critical elements is a gendered aspect, and that's of the people who make it. And they're called Bayanas, and they're daughters of the goddess Iyasa. So Iyasa is a goddess in Afro-Brazilian religion, Kandoble, which has links, direct links to a Nigerian equivalent goddess called Oya. And she was meant to be the goddess of war, and akarajé is her favorite food. 
So the Bayanas are daughters of Inyasa who had been trained through mothers and through you know, matrilineal heritage to make and serve Akaraje. So Akaraje began in a very sacred religious context. It wasn't secular for a long time. Um, the first mention of Akaraje is in the 18th century when um, a Portuguese worker describes you know, it talks about how you'd see enslaved coming out and selling things on the street, um, akaka, akaraje, coconut rice, and things like that. And this was in 1787. And what was really interesting is that the context of it was on the street. And I'll share later, but akara is also a street food in Nigeria. And so just reading and, and, and delving into akaraje, say bringing up the parallels and I could see how Akaraje is this embodied knowledge in spite of the torture and torment of enslavement that the Bayanas had held on to and they had they had taken they, they had kind of preserved this memory as a form of resistance and you can imagine it was at a time when enslaved were not allowed to read and write and document so the, the power of them preserving that knowledge and sustaining it. I'm talking 1787 and we're in the 2000, 2020s, right? And to, to preserve this over 200 years, just purely by the strength of oral transmission. Um, at the end of slave trade in the late 1800s, the Bayanas then took a carriage to the streets. So it became something that left the terrarios, that left the temples and the sacred place and had a secular component to it. But they continued to be the sole um, kind of gender. It, it, these Bayanas continue to be the sole preservers and keepers of this culture. And, you know, as things progressed um, in the early 2000s, there was talk of non bayanas selling a carriage, and that caused a lot of problems because there was a dispute. Like people are saying, oh, the, the carriage sold by the bayanas has some um, uh, juju, has some religious context. And there was the opposition from Catholic people who wanted to sell it as well. And, and you know, the carriage, the daughters of Inyasa, the bayanas were like, Look, this is something religious. This is something that's essential to our culture and our history. You disparage that, and now you want to partake of it. So there's a lot of um, back and forth. But one of the big events was in 2012, prior to the 2014 Olympics, when um, the Bayanas were not invited to negotiate and to participate in selling food as part of the FIFA World Cup uh, plans. And it was confusing because they are like, look, we have government recognition as intangible cultural heritage, as something that is peculiar to Bayer. It's something we're praised, yet we're not included. So in spite of their gendered knowledge, in spite of the fact that they're recognized as preservers of intangible culture or heritage, there's still a lot of exclusion because of the Black Association, because of their links to Africa and slavery and enslavement. And so that was very confusing because there's no Akaraje without the Bayana. The Bayana is the symbol. People who haven't even been to Brazil know about Akaraje, they know about Bayanas. And you know, these women worked and continue to work not only to sustain themselves, they use the earnings from selling a carriage to procure their freedom, but also to kind of support their families. And you see parallels of this community sisterhood, this family carer and keeper with 
Akara Sellers in Nigeria. Uh, these two images I, I really like because on the left you have the Bayana um, selling her Akarajé in palm oil and she has on their ritual dress. It's a colorful headscarf, white um, petticoat and skirt, and then a colorful waist wrap. And on the right, you have a Nigerian Akara seller who also protects her hair, who has a wrapper as well. And you can see so many similarities and so many parallels between these two women. But the one thing that surprised me is the way Akara share is eaten in Brazil is very different from the way Akara is eaten in Nigeria. And even just looking at the names, you know, I, I was like, where did this Akara share come from? And why is it different from Akara? And so I, I went to a dictionary, an 1898 dictionary, where Akara is described as a bread. And when you look at Akara share, you see that it's cut in half and it's stuffed. I showed that in some earlier photos. It's stuffed with a lot of things. Whereas in Nigeria, akara is a fritter and, and it, it's not bready. And as so I say, thinking about how did the, things change? And it's interesting to see that the dictionary describes akara as a bread or cake of which there are very different kinds. You know, you have the fancy ones, you have some made with okra and corn and a number of things. As I say, thinking about if a carriage, a carriage seems to be preserved in its original format. It feels like the present day Nigerian way of eating a carriage with bread because bread only came to Nigeria in the late um, 1800s and early 1900s. So it feels as though a carriage distinct, different, removed from Nigeria, but deeply connected, it preserves the original context and form of eating it. And it brought to me two words that I've learned and, and that helped me distinguish food in its functional capacity and food as something that nourishes your soul, that strengthens you, that inspires you. And it's a quote from Roberta de Mata, uh, and it, it's documented in a book by Marcus Wood, Black Milk. My Portuguese is non-existent, but it, it, it basically says, sanduiche alimenta, a carriage a comida. And it's saying that a sandwich is grub. It, it, it serves a functional purpose, it fills your belly, but the akarajé with all that it embodies, with, with the history, with the, the religious context, with, with the ritual of its making and eating is soul food. And it makes me incredibly proud and encouraged and inspired by these Bayanas who, in spite of the torture and torment, did what they had to, to preserve a carriage, helping me now create a link between Nigeria and its diaspora. I'll move on to the second part of this, and it's, I'm gonna quote the state of Nigerian and West African cuisine as seen in literature. Um, it's still quite rare to find a mention of gastronomy or culinary practices, of ingredients, dishes, combinations of tastes and meals prepared and shared by ordinary people. Africa is still today perceived as being the missing course in the global banquet of food and drinks. And it's why I take my work um, and my exploration, my interests very seriously because of the lack of documentation. But I didn't know what the importance of that documentation. I didn't really understand food as a part of cultural identity, um, as a thing that could bring soothe, that could soothe your soul, that could strengthen you, could encourage you. And when I read this quote by James Baldwin, it made me understand 
the new identity I was discovering about, you know, this new space I was evolving into. And he says, you don't have a home until you leave it. And then when you have left it, you can never go back. And for me, my interest in Nigerian cuisine didn't start till I moved abroad. I wasn't really, like, I love Nigerian cuisine, but I, I feel like I kind of took it for granted. It was being abroad, living and working in the Netherlands in 2009 that, you know, brought a carriage into focus for me, but then brought all these connections. And at that point, I started collecting cookbooks. Um, I had, I started collecting a range of cookbooks, most of which are authored by women. Uh, there's several that are authored by Nigerian women, West African women, um, American women who lived in Nigeria, and British women who lived in Nigeria. And in the process of exploring this newfound identity as someone who was interested in Nigerian food and food as more than eating, I came up with a few, I don't want to call them conflicts, but, but there were a few situations where people questioned my authority um, and my authenticity as someone who was speaking on Nigerian food. And it kind of brought me into the space of, yes, I'm speaking about Nigerian food, but I'm doing it in both individual and personal contexts, but also as someone who wants to bring Nigerian food into broader focus for Nigerians. Because my original state of being where I didn't really know much about Nigerian cuisine or, or value it is something that is common in Nigeria. And that is because of colonization, erasure, and lack of documentation, and also the minimizing of West African and Nigerian culinary heritage. And so one of the things I started doing when I moved back to Nigeria is like, okay, I really want to understand ingredients as ingredients. I want to honor, respect the traditional context in which they've been used, but I also want to explore new uses because there's, there seemed to be a lot of possibility with Nigerian ingredients that wasn't being explored. And one of the first things I did was take a favorite fruit of mine, Abalumo, which is uh, the African star apple. And it's a fruit that's eating out of hand. And up till 2015, we didn't do much with it, but eat it out of hand. And I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought about, you know, what can I do with it? Can I bake it into desserts? Can I turn it into wine? Can I preserve it? And I started exploring and documenting that. And I got a lot of pushback from people, you know. I, I, I made an Abaluman mango tata tan and, and someone was like, oh, people are taking this, you know, creating thing way too far outside of the box. And like, what's the purpose? Why can't we just enjoy things the way we've always enjoyed them? That was six years ago. Today, there are people who are making Adbalumo liqueurs. Adbalumo has been turned into powder. So industries, small, large, um, and now taking this fruit that we only ate out of hand up to a point and transforming it into new things. Um, most recently, I had a conversation with someone on Twitter a few days ago. I reshared a, a 2019 article that was published in the New York Times, and it was looking at weeknight dinners around the world. Um, and I had made what a lot of people considered a non-traditional Nigerian dinner, but I had used all the ingredients I had used were Nigerian ingredients. I had used them in ways that exist in Nigerian cuisine, but in different forms. And you know, someone said to me, uh, very little of what you've made is in any way representative of Ninja cuisine. And, you know, people don't typically have suya for dinner. And I'll talk about that shortly. And are you, are you actually Nigerian? And it was funny because I'm like, people are calling, like, at what stage and how do I explore my own agency and my personal agency? How do I take Nigerian ingredients, create things that I think honor and respect Nigerian cuisine, but don't look like what people expect of Nigerian cuisine. And this came from Nigerians. And it, it just made me start thinking about some of the early works of Nigerian in Nigerian cuisine. So these are three books. 
1910 cookbook written by British women, a 1934 cookbook written by British women, and a 1962 cookbook written post Nigerian independence in 1960. I share these books because some of what we consider Nigerian today is, actual, is actually foreign. So stock was from the 1910 cookbook. Nigerians didn't typically cook with stock. And now Nigerians cook with stock and assume that as something has been part of the culinary heritage. Boiled eggs and stew and soups was not something that was traditional to Nigerian cuisine. It was a 1930s edict after the Great Depression when Domestic science was being pushed by British colonial women and education officers. And they were teaching colonial uh, domestic science and encouraging Nigerian women to, to be domesticated and to cook more at home. And they were also trying to bridge a gap, one in knowledge, but also encouraging people to eat more protein because there was talk of malnutrition all around the world, but particularly in Britain and its colonies. And so they encouraged boiled eggs and Nigerian stew and soups, but that's not something that is common knowledge. Looking at stockfish, which is salted cod, a lot of Nigerians consider it Nigerian, but it actually comes, comes from Scandinavia. And so looking at these things, your know, people think, oh, all of these are Nigerian things, but they're not. And, and part of the work that I seek to do is to document, is to unravel these the histories and to share them, not to diminish them, but to contextualize them. I'm gonna talk again about questions of authenticity from abroad. A few years ago, I was contacted by um, Deutsche Welle, which is a, a German station, and they wanted to do a mini documentary on me and my work. And I ended up creating a cassava and coconut salad based on a Nigerian street food pairing of cassava and coconut. I was shocked that a few months later, the documentary never ran because according to the producers, I promised something that was Nigerian, but what I created looked very European. I went shopping in a place that looked like Europe. And, and there was this question about the authenticity of what I created. And that surprised me because I was like, look, the fact that a roadside place I go to shop in Nigeria resembles Europe doesn't mean that it's not Nigeria. And what does that, like, there isn't one way to frame what Nigerian markets are like. And that brought to me this idea of how people perceive Nigerian cuisine and how people want to see Nigerian cuisine and how I sometimes come against roadblocks when I show a different perspective. Leaving authenticity now to the role of gender. Gendered labor in Nigerian cuisine is very mixed. So there's some things that men do. It's very binary. I, I will say that up front. So there's some things that men do. There's some things that women do. There's some things that both men and women do across production, preparation, and service. And you know, top left, you will. This is a market. This is a fish market. And in um, Lagos, in Ekme, women are fishermen, but you also have male fishermen who bring fish from the Atlantic. Um, when you look at produce, you look at fruit selling in the streets, you'll find both men and women as sellers. So this is a uh, gentleman selling sugar cane. In the markets, you'll find some things are very gender specific, and others are not. So like tomatoes, onions, and peppers, which form a major part of our culinary canon, you'll find both male and female people selling. More physically intense um, labor and production, you'll find men. So you'll find men in butchery, in bread making, in sometimes a lot of meat work. Um, this is a female seller who's selling bread and beans. This is a male seller who's selling tea and bread as well. And then on the bottom right, you have suya sellers. So suya is like grilled skewered meats. And it's one place where gender, where men 
dominate. So I have never met a female suya seller in my life. Uh, suya sellers are men, uh, male. Um, and then just thinking about gendered eating in the sense of are there some foods that are only for men and all foods that are only for women. There are a number of things across different regional cultures in Nigeria. But one thing that is interesting that I saw growing up was that if there was a whole chicken in a family, it was cooked, um, the drumsticks, the gizzard would typically go to the man, to the head of the household. And that was very, very interesting. It's changed now, but that was something that stood out um, throughout time. And this brings me to the end of this sharing. I, I hope that a lot of it was connected, uh, um, but in just thinking about the work that I do, the things that I'm interested in, I've come to the realization that I'm gonna have to learn who I am and no one can teach me that and people can just, define and describe different aspects of Nigerian cuisine, West African cuisine, but it's not, it's not monolithic. Um, there's nothing like African cuisine. I'm who I am, I know what I need, and I'm gonna have to find out all of that for myself. And finally, I come on to the future of some of the work that I do. So I shared about Feast Afrique and um, this library and, you know, there's a data aspect to it. And, you know, I, my hope is that by collecting this reference material, that it, it encourages a wider audience of people who are enthusiastic to those who want to explore scholarship around it. And that, you know, the, the gospel of West African cuisine grows. Um, once again, thank you for having me. That is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Ozas. That was amazing. We're delighted. Um, already the questions are pouring in. So um, Cheryl and I are going to go back and forth asking the questions. I'm going to start off and you can respond in whatever way you'd like. Um, so I will ask the first one here. It seems like one of the threads that ties together Akarahe in Brazil and your exploration of Nigerian ingredients is the question, who gets to decide what authentic national cuisine is? And what are the consequences of these decisions for gender roles and gendered power? Could you please say more about this? Um, yes. It, the, the, the question of defining national cuisine is problematic if we're looking at single elements. I, I think in defining a national cuisine, especially in places where there are multiple influences, it can't be one thing. And there's like, it, it's a combination of everything. It's a combination for me of traditional elements, but also contemporary approaches because culture isn't something that's static. It's something that evolves. And, and as, we, as we grow and as we're exposed to frameworks in other places where we can draw parallels, we do what we need to do to understand um, the culture and cuisine. So in, in deciding authentic national cuisine, I think it is, it's not the job of one person. And in the case of Nigeria and West Africa, it's even more problematic because the documentation his the documentation is recent. It, 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 it's a budding, it's a budding field of study. Um, so not one person can decide it. And, and the consequences for gendered roles is what I see that even today just like it was with the cookbooks, there's a disproportionate amount of women in the space of documenting. So whether you're looking at blogs, uh, YouTube channels, um, podcasts around Nigerian food and, and, and history, it is very skewed. And, you know, there's an assumption that women's place 
is in the kitchen. We see that across the globe and that hasn't changed. And the other thing is that you see women's face in the kitchen, but you see male chefs as the more external commercial presentation part of it. But, you know, yeah, I hope that I addressed some of your points. Uh, okay, we have another question. Um, I would love to hear more about this fixation on culinary authenticity. Do you think the responses online have also to do with your online presence as a female food writer dealing with male commentators? Just wondering if you have a feeling who exactly is making these critiques of your work. So it's it's mixed, actually. Um, I guess, you know, the, the fixation, Nigerians largely are quite traditional in their approaches towards food. Like a Nigerian will go abroad and seek out Nigerian food. And so it feels like a desecration when, you know, I share some new ideas and some new possibilities about exploring food. I think it goes back to my training as a geologist where you know at an expression geologist and it's always looking we're always looking at possibility and how you tie the past to the present and and how you kind of what what landscapes and frontiers open up but that's not a common frame of looking at, at things and i've actually found quite equal <laughs> um critiques of my work so both male and female people have been like, well, this is not Nigerian. What are you doing? The, you're doing the most. You're, you know, you're taking this too far. And, but for me, my longer term goal is to help people. It wants to create an interest around Nigerian cuisine and, and help Nigerians find new appreciation, not just for the food, but for the impact it's had on African American. American, Caribbean, European culinary heritage. And it's that's what I'm seeking to bring awareness to. And along the way, there's also, the, you know, the f exploring ideas and ingredients. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, we've got a ne our next question is, I love that you talked about nostalgia and missing foods from home as a diasporic traveler and explorer. What roles does nostalgia play in your personal cooking? Do you mix elements from foods you miss or long for with foods from wherever you happen to be traveling or living? If so, what are some of your favorite dishes that you've created this way? And nostalgia plays a huge part. This is the third time, so I'm new to Canada. I moved here in January of 2020 and it's um, the role of nostalgia and memory is a big part of my work. So I, I remember home, I remember tastes and flavors from my childhood and try to recreate them. And so like Saturday mornings is in Nigeria is typically Akara day. So across Nigeria, across the country, if there ever was a national dish that Akara is one of them, you'll find people on the street selling, buying, eating, and making Akara. So that's one of the things that, that's one of the traditions that I recreate in my home kitchen. And the other thing is that I'm constantly, greens are a large part of Nigerian cooking. We have a rich um, arsenal of greens. At, at my last count, I could find about 50 edible greens, leafy greens and herbs. And, and what I try to do is explore new um, greens that I'm not familiar with. So bok choy, bok choy, um, other kinds of greens using Nigerian flavor bases. So I, I sometimes mix and match out of curiosity, out of the contents of my fridge. And one of the things that I miss when I'm away from home is so that's the African star apple that I shared with, yeah, I shared a photo of earlier. It's a fruit that is, it has so many components. It's sweet, it's sour, it's tart. There's no other fruit around the world that quite describes the texture. It, it's very high in pectin. And so you can chew the skin and it will turn into gum, like chewing gum. And 
that's the one thing that I miss. And um, yeah, I occasionally have some F rated and then I freeze. And that's also one way that I, I take home with me. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Okay, thank you, Charles. Got the next one. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, got the feedback here. Very outer space. I can ask it while we sort out the feedback issues. <laughs> um, okay, thank you for your presentation and for your important work archiving and making available resources on African foodways. I'm struck, however, by how you did not mention ethnicity yet in Nigerian food. It, um, sorry, ethnicity yet. Nigerian food is seen as deeply shaped by and associated with ethnicity, um, Igbo, Yoruba, Ogoni, etc. Can we speak about Nigerian food without recognizing ethnic affiliation? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, as someone who isn't from the major tribes as they're recognized in Nigeria, which is a colonial construct, it, Igbo in the east, Yoruba in the south and west, um, uh, Ogonis in the south, and House in the north. Um, one thing that I try to do in my work is to strip things down to explore the common elements. And, and what, I, what I found is that across Igbo, Yoruba, House, uh, we eat the same way starches with stews and soups, thin broths, pottages, um, salads, fritters. And the ethnicity comes in the different names, comes in the, you know, the naming convention, and also comes in the variation in ingredients. So a soup made from okra in the Southwest might use a specific kind of fermented beans. And the same okra soup made in the east of Nigeria will use a different kind of fermented beans. But at the core, on an elemental level, they are the same. And yes, there's some exceptions. But when you look at the core, the, the, the essential, the 80% framework of, of the culture and cuisine, the foods are essentially the same. They go by different names. So Akara, you'll find it in most parts of the country as Akara. In the North, you'll find it as Kose, but it, you'll find it on a Saturday morning. Um, you know, so I move away from ethnic affiliation because it quickly gets into a position where cultures and regions are excluded and erased. And if the goal is to recognize that there are national elements in what we eat, then that's the first thing that I'd like to share. And in some contexts, you know, we, in talking about different aspects, sometimes I go into that real specific ethnic framework, but in general, this work is still in its infancy. Like Nigerians don't even know enough about Nigerian cuisine and, and to, to get lost right now in, you know, the detail of, you know, in the specificity is not something one, I don't, you know, I don't have the range right now. And two, it's not also, what I, I it's not how I'd like to approach it from a building blocks um, point of view. Thank you. We're still um, experiencing some feedback issues. So you're stuck with me for reading the remainder of the questions aloud, <laughs> but I will continue to convey them. Uh, so our next is about the presence of people from India in Nigeria. Do you think that Nigerian food culture has influenced Indian food culture and vice versa? I, Indian food culture has definitely influenced Nigerian food culture. And I say that because there's a category of dishes in Nigeria, which we call small chops, uh, appetizers. And they've become really popular in the last 10, 20 years. Essentially, 
Small chops is five or six small bites, typically in a pack. Um, and they consist of fried dough, some kind of meat, spring onions, I'm sorry, spring rolls, Chinese spring rolls, and Indian samosas. And it, it, Nigeria and India have had a long relationship. It started in the 50s and, and around the 80s, there was a huge boom in the Nigerian economy with oil. And there was a, a lot of experts, a lot of European and American experts left the country. There was also a regime change, left the country. And, but the, a lot of Indians and Chinese stayed. Chinese were actually some of the earliest people in, in Nigeria. Um, but a lot of Indian people stayed. And what you saw is that in the 50s, small chops is very much composed of British elements, deviled eggs, um, anchovy and toast, and things like that. And by the 80s, with the British leaving, that had an impact on grocery stores and grocery shopping. And you, you had a lot of Indian stores kind of growing and and becoming more popular. And you saw more Indian elements impact Nigerian cuisine. So samosa is, as most Nigerians know samosa, and they might not know how it became part of this canon of small chops um, bites, but there's definitely that connection. I'm not sure how Nigerian cuisine has influenced Indian cuisine, but yes. Thank you. That makes me really hungry. <laughs> okay, especially the samosas. Um, next question is, could you say anything about media and how that influences the creation and imagination of Nigerian cuisine? Um, this, this questioner is asking, says that they're thinking about the celebrity chef phenomenon and wondering if and how you've encountered that yourself. I think it's a very particular framing that Western media likes to see of Nigerians. Like, you know, when you talk about Nigerian cuisine, um, it's still very a very peripheral approach that, that food media tends to take. So they're not really ready to get down and dirty and to like, you know, across soup and to explore the draw. You know, people love the jollof rice. You know, they love fried plantains. They like the basic, they, they, they want the basic foods, you know, but, but in terms of really getting to the heart of what a Nigerian table looks like, a Nigerian pantry looks like, it's still very, very, very early days. And so sometimes, you know, when I, when I get approached to present things in a certain way, I, I sometimes say no. And that for me is growth because at, at the start of this, I didn't think that this would be a career. It was, it was a deep interest to root myself, to understand myself, understand my heritage and identity. And, at the start, I would say yes to everything. And um, be, just because I like a really, I, like I think Nigerian food is delicious and would love people to explore it and to see it as something more than basic, to see it as a cuisine that has ties to French cuisine, for instance. They, you know, I can tell you about five French dishes that have Nigerian you know, Nigerian equivalents that are as delicious, if not more, you know, from snails to culinary technique, techniques and chiffonading, you know, so in, in French cuisine, you'll find chef, you know, doing this fine slice. In Nigeria, you'll find the market woman or the market man doing that delicate, only ascribed to chef techniques. Um, you know, there's cow head, tête de veau in French, and in Nigeria, you have goat head, which is so delicious and and so just looking at how the differences in perception of Nigerian cuisine as largely unrefined as you know pedestrian 
Yet when you juxtapose that against French cuisine, you're like, oh my, there's, you know, there, there's so much here to compare that could be as delicious if we, ex you know, went down those paths. So uh, there's hope yet. Wonderful. Okay, our next question is about your experiences in Canada. So can you tell us a little bit about what it's been like cooking, living and shopping? In the Canadian landscape, um, like I said, I you know I moved to Canada two months before COVID uh, for the lockdown, and you know I had so essentially for the last year and a half, I've just really gotten familiar with my condo, and and and, and I I mean the first time I went to a farmer's market was like two weeks ago. That was the first time I'd you know really gone out, and but it's been a, I'm someone who loves I love learning, and so just going to supermarkets, particularly supermarkets that host a wide range of cuisines and, and have, you know, several aisles that, you know, from Asia to Africa have been really, really helpful in helping me discover the wealth and an abundance of what is available. I haven't explored specific Canadian foods as much as I want to be on maple syrup and Saskatoon berries, which I've recently learned about, and they're all around my condo. So, you know, I've been foraging a bit. Um, but I've cooked a lot. I've cooked a lot as therapy, as, as comfort over the last um, few months. And it's just been a great opportunity to learn about new fruits and vegetables. Because as much as I love work, explore Nigerian and West African culinary heritage and history and foods, I'm plain and simple a food enthusiast and lover. So, you know, food is the thing that gets me moving and it's, it's food from around the world. And so that has been really, it's been nice to explore fruits, vegetables, new herbs um, and things like that. That's wonderful. Actually, that leads us really well into the next question, which is about seasonality. So You've lived in many different places with many different kinds of climates and seasons. Can you speak to the way that seasonality has shaped your eating and your cooking and your thinking about food in those different places? I didn't think about, I grew up with seasonality, but not recognizing it for what it was. Um, and when I first moved to the Netherlands, you know, I'd be I was so surprised about the fact that things changed and it reminded me like I would see rhubarb and, and white asparagus and I was like oh yeah these things are really seasonal and, and I came across seasonal produce calendars which inspired me to create one for Nigeria and what I discovered is that uh, Nigerians eat very seasonally extremely eat snack seasonally but I found that across the world, there's some things that are in season at the same time. And when I say across the world, I'm talking about areas with similar geographical or climatic conditions. So the West African stat apple has purple and green um, cousins that are popular in Cambodia and Southeast Asia. And they're in season around the same time, December, to like early spring. So that surprised me because like when I was in Nigeria at Baluma season, the, the West African, the African star apple was all, was a season that I, I waited for, enjoyed throughout. And, you know, and, and I preserved a lot of fruit, um, you know, so that when the season ended, I still had that. But coming here and longing for Agbalumo and then going to a store and seeing, not Agbalumo itself, but seeing its cousins, you know, kind of gave me comfort and joy. Mangoes are another thing that, yeah, another fruit that are seasonal, again, across this, you know, kind of tropical, subtropical areas. And, and so it's mango season in Nigeria now, just the same as it is in many parts of North America. And so seeing those, the season that I recognize also existing in some form here has been really, really interesting. And um, yeah, I embrace seasonal eating for what I can learn about the fruits and vegetables, but also because seasonal produce tastes best, quite often tastes best in season. 
Absolutely. Um, okay, let's see where we are with our next one. Um, uh, I think we might be done. Any other questions from the audience? We'll give everyone just like a second to think a little bit more. Okay. I think everyone may have had their questions answered. Oh, also, so there's, there's a question here, I think, adapted from Siobhan Lambert Hurley. Oh, yes, of course. So it's been noted that it's difficult to recover the tastes. I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't scroll up far enough. Thank you. <laughs> it's been noted that it's difficult to recover the tastes, textures, and smells of food from the historical archive. But I found travel narratives especially useful here. Your emphasis on not gaining an interest in Nigerian cuisine until you left to live abroad suggests that this could be a broader phenomenon. What do you see as the relationship between travel narratives and food memory? Thank you for that. I think for me, it's been, you know, you're in a new place. There's so much that's going on to settle into being part of this new community, living in this new space, you know, encountering new climates and temperatures and food. People have different approaches to finding comfort. You know, food, food is mine, <laughs> food, and, food, food is mine. And, and so, you know, I'd get, it, I'd get to points where I just sit and reminisce, not really homesick, but just thinking and reminiscing about home. You know, so in December, I'll be thinking about, ah, oh, this is Agba Luma season. I'd, you know, I'd be remembering things that, I'd remember things that I would be doing in Agba Luma season. And, and I think there's a very, food memory has such a very, has a strong power um, because of all the things that it embodies, you know, because of the sense of community, sense of family, friendships, um, being part of something. And so I, I feel like the relationship between movement, between travel is using food as an anchor of sorts. You know, food is this thing that gives you a sense of community, a sense of identity, a sense of being, even when you're remote from it. So I can I can conjure up memories. Like when I when I'm when I'm cooking akara in my kitchen in Canada on a Saturday morning, um, you know, I'm using beans from you know, a different country, but the smells transport me to my mother's kitchen and, and to my own kitchen when I, you know, when I first started my family and, and all of that just, it's a multifaceted thing. But for me, the aim is, is comfort and, and in a way, a confidence boost that, you know, there are things that root me and tie me to who I am, that I have a history, that I have heritage that I can call on, that there's, there's a legacy that has been left for me that I can, I can refer to and I can, you know, recall. Okay, our next one is about, um, is about tomatoes, um, wild sourced from the Americas. So the question is, could you please speak about the role of tomatoes in Nigerian cuisine and the origin of this role of tomatoes in Nigerian cuisine? Um, so the, the Nigerian cuisine, uh, tomatoes in Nigerian cuisine are a huge part of our cuisine. And, and I think it goes back to that, you know, when we're talking about authenticity, because tomatoes, peppers, some forms of peppers were not, indigenous to West Africa, but West Africa and Nigeria, but have become a strong part of the culinary canon that, um, yeah, it's just what it is. I, uh, Nigerians, I mean, there's something called stew in Nigeria, which is a tomato based sauce or, or a red pepper based sauce, mostly a, a combination of tomatoes and red peppers. And, and you know, there's a green version as well. Uh, and, and stew is that thing that you'll find 
across all Nigerian kitchens in different formats and different forms. But Nigerians recognize that when you say stew, you're not talking about a process, you're talking about a specific dish. Um, so yes, tomatoes are important. How they became important, I can't say, but I, I, I suspect that jollof rice, which became really popular in the 50s and 60s, played a role in that because um, there's a there's a tomato stew base that you know, forms the platform for jollof rice, which is a popular uh, common dish in, in Nigeria, both an everyday dish, but also an occasion dish. Um, so I, I can't speak much about the origins beyond that, you know, it was brought by the Portuguese. That's fascinating to think, especially of something becoming such a staple that it gains in popularity because it almost fades to the background of the dish rather than being in the forefront. I think that's really interesting. Okay, this, you look, have... Sorry, oh, cassava is another one, right? To cassava, when Nigerians think of cassava today, Nigerians think of cassava as being Nigerian, but cassava was brought by the Portuguese and in the 15th and 16th centuries. And it didn't take root because knowledge of processing the toxic varieties wasn't there. It wasn't until the enslaved returned in the late 18th century and early 19th century and brought with them knowledge of processing cassava from indigenous Amazonians and that cassava really took root. And now it exists in various forms across West Africa, across Nigeria and West Africa. And it's hard to think of it as not being an original indigenous crop, but it wasn't. Yeah, it travels, food travels so many directions um, and so quickly, it's astounding. It's amazing. Okay, we have many more questions. So I, 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 will, I will do my duty here. Okay, um, have you found any connections with West African cuisine and health benefits within consuming these foods? Do you see any of these cuisines connected to any recent food trends connected to health and wellness? And there's been a lot of local work done on the health benefits of West African food and ingredients, particularly fermented foods. So fermented foods have such a huge place in Nigerian cuisine, from seasoning to um, starches and proteins. And, and however, in global spheres and because of food media, it's often conflated with being high in fat, being deep fried. And, and there's, a, there's a specific narrative of Nigerian and West African food as peppery and hot, as flavors being muddied, as um, a lot being fatty, that kind of, put a veil over the fact that when you take the ingredients that make up these dishes, there are incredible health benefits to them. So many Nigerian soups and stews will include fermented seeds as seasoning, but also as you know, part of the flavor element of the dish. Um, when you think about deep frying in Nigeria, and you look at that with the French confit that has looked at as you know cerebral and sophisticated luxuriant yeah. yes and, you know <laughs> you know and, 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 and yes you know confing and deep frying are you know the, the chemical processes are different but the outcomes sometimes are very similar so there are numerous health benefits that get overshadowed with common perceptions what I say. Absolutely. Um, it, there's, a, there's a cornstarch dish in Nigeria called, we call it akamu. Sometimes it's called pap um, or coco. It's similar to Mexican atole. When you look and, and when you look at co the corn, it's fermented. It's fermented over three days. And what that does to the bioavailability of some of the nutrients is outstanding. And there's a research paper that um, shows fermentation, shows nixtamalization, which is the process 
by which corn is converted into a dough for Mexican masa. You see that the, the fermentation of this Nigerian cornstarch is incredible in just how much it expands the range of bioavailable nutrients. And so this is where more scholarship is needed. And, and then I think for me, one of the critical things is I often can go really deep in my work and get stuck in research because the basic framework and knowledge, we're not there yet to have the very deep conversations around foods um, in, 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 in kind of a research, it, through a research lens. And so a lot of the work I try to do is to bring awareness, you know, to let people, there's often this disparaging, even sometimes by Nigerians of Nigerian cuisine, because they don't see it as this thing that has incredible value, not because they wouldn't recognize the value, but just because it's always been around. And so, you know, I hope that we continue to do more work to share the nutritional benefits, but also beyond that, just the absolute deliciousness of, of the food. Okay, next. It is perhaps not surprising that people are really conservative about food and express a backlash against novelty. Food, unlike other parts of culture, is taken into the body and really becomes part of the self. Change around food is thus hard because of its deep connections to who we quite literally are as embodied beings. Do you have any thoughts about food conservatism in this light? Um, so thank you for that. Um, I think they're missing links in how Nigerians view food. And that I attribute to a displacement of Nigerian home economics, Nigerian history, Nigerian geography. In most schools, people learn about British history and people learn about British foods. And, and so that closure, that, that reluctance to embrace the possibility of Nigerian cuisine is because it hasn't really occurred, it hasn't really occupied pride of place for a long time. And just helping reframe that, re reframing the importance. It, it's why I consider this like, you know, something that I want to give my time and energy to. Um, I, I, because Nigerians also embrace non-Nigerian foods. So fast food, whether that's burgers, fries, are competing in, in many ways with Nigerian food. In, in when pe I hope that as people begin to see Nigerian cuisine as something valuable, they'll embrace that. But and, and that's not to negate the other things that they can enjoy and the other foods they can enjoy, but to really center it as important, as, as being something that is worth exploring because Nigerians explore with other aspects of culture, Afrobeats and music, Nigerian fabric and fashion. Like creativity is, and yes, you know, maybe it's a sense of what we ingest, but if we only want to explore, because you can take the same ingredient and transform it in many ways. And my appeal is it's the same ingredient just presented in a different way. You know, the, the method of cooking is not fundamentally different from what you've exp experienced already in the traditional Nigerian cuisine, but why not explore this in a new way? Why don't you, why don't you see other frames and other possibilities? So, yeah, it, it feels like advocating for things that people already do and just helping them see new possibilities. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and actually it's a great, a really great transition to our next one, um, which given our time will probably be our last question, I would imagine. Um, how would you, which is a shame because we have many more, so we'll save them. And, um, and I'd also encourage anyone who has a, question that comes up later or who didn't get their question answered over the course of the um, talk today, 
put it into the Slack chat. There's a special channel just for Ozos's talk. And so you can um, put more, more questions there. Okay, so last one. How would you go about teaching African food history to students in Canada or the United States who know very little about the continent in general, let alone its incredibly diverse and deep culinary past? And who likely bring their own myths and preconceptions about what Africa means to the classroom? Yeah, thank you for that. And that's my eventual goal. Um, one of the projects that I've recently worked on is I created two short films and they're based on ingredients. So looking at ingredients, I think ingredients are a great SI unit. Um, everyone knows rice, beans, everyone can relate to oil. And, and in, in these two films, I worked with a spoken word poet, both to kind of strengthen my curatorial and museological skills, but also to share little known histories about ingredients. And, and, and these films are eight minutes long and I can share a link later on. And, and the idea is that they, they talk about the ingredients and it's in its form, it's, its common uses, but also some kind of larger themes. So for instance, when, when I talk about okra in the film, we talk about how language is a powerful way to promote or, or demote a culture. We talk about theories like double consciousness that W.E. Du Bois talked about and how, you know, you know, lang language can be a very powerful tool and how, and how do we use language to reframe. When we talk about palm oil, we talk about things like how West African enslaved preserved palm oil, but also how palm oil grows, right? And, you know, it, it kind of in, includes a lot of other aspects, you know, there's geography, there's etymology, the, you know, there several aspects, but starting with ingredients is a great way because it's, it's something that's common and easy to talk about without, it's something to talk about and build on. Um, so I definitely start you know, starting, start with ingredients. I, and I try to find similarities in my work. I, I do, I do something I call around the world in. So it's, it's when I'll take a dish, like I'll take a, in Nigeria, we call it palm oil chop, but it's a rice centered dish with 13 to a hundred sides. And it reminds me of the Korean dosirak, where you have rice as a central dish, and then you have the banchan and the Dutch Indonesian construct of a rice tafel, where you have rice and you have, you know, smaller dishes. So, so I'll take an ingredient and then try to explore where else it exists across the world that people might be familiar with. And that way we're seeing ways that were similar, but also ways that were different. And, and yeah, celebrating that duality of how we can basically have similar approaches, but in are also different in a way. Um, I'll drop some links in the chat shortly. Yeah, but we'd yeah. love to hear more about the films. That sounds so incredible if they're shareable. Yes, so just give me one minute. Yes, and take your time. While you do that, I'm going to toss things back over to Catherine, who's going to close up the session. But before um, I do, I'd just like to lead everyone in a rousing round of applause for this remarkable talk. You can only hear me clapping, <laughs> but I'm confident everyone is clapping along with me. Um, and now I will pass things to Catherine. Thank you, Amanda.